Today, it's great to have Nick Gillespie on the podcast. Nick is a libertarian journalist who is currently an editor-at-large at Reason. A two-time finalist for Digital National Magazine Awards, Gillespie's work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the New York Post, Slate, Salon, Time.com, Marketplace, and basically any other publication that you're ever going to read. The Daily Beast named Nick one of, quote, the right's top 25 journalists, calling him, quote, clear-headed, brainy, among the foremost libertarians in America. Nick, it's so great to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me, Scott. It's a real pleasure to be here. The motto of Reason Magazine, which you've really spearheaded and, and, and uh, been uh, part of parcel of for, for many years, is, quote, free minds and free markets. I was wondering if we could start with you kind of explaining what that means and, you know, even just our listeners um, who aren't even familiar with libertarianism at all. Yeah, so Reason was uh, founded in 1968 by a guy who was a student at Boston University, um, and then it kind of migrated from him and from Boston to Santa Barbara on the West Coast to L.A., where it's still technically headquartered, and now we have a big office in Washington, D.C., as well as people scattered all over the country. And we're, you know, we started out as a monthly uh, politics and culture magazine, kind of similar to the New Republic or National Review along those lines. And like a lot of other um, publications, we branched out into the web. We were early adopters. Uh, we have a, we've had a website since I think 1994. And then we uh, created a video platform in 2007, which I spearheaded. I was the editor in chief of the print magazine from uh, 2000 to 2008. Uh, video platform, the website at various points. But um, the free minds and free markets uh, concept comes, as you, as you mentioned, we're a limited, uh, we're a libertarian publication, which means we believe in kind of limited government, individualism, and the idea that uh, kind of civil liberties and economic liberties are really kind of uh, twin, different sides of the same coin. So um, you need to be free thinking in and tolerant and interested in empathy and pluralism, as well as also, um, you know, kind of um, exercising autonomy in everything you do. And the way that plays out, it used to be that we could say to people, you know, we're kind of socially liberal and fiscally conservative. But, um, you know, that made sense in like 1975 and maybe even 1995 in 2021. I don't know what that means, because. Most a lot of liberals and progressives are not very tolerant. Uh, you know, they're trying to shut down all kinds of speech and they're trying to regulate all sorts of lifestyles, you know, that they don't like. And conservatives used to be people who would say, you know what, the government should be small and it shouldn't be, you know, it should pay for itself. And of course, that went out the window, you know, a long time ago. It's a really good point. And everything seems a bit topsy turvy right now in, in every imaginable dimension. Now, you know, it's interesting because the Daily Beast named you one of the right's top 25 journalists. The, yeah. the, putting you, putting you on the right seems in, is interesting thing. I don't know if you would agree with that characterization. It seems like libertarianism. I mean, you can be libertarian left, right? You can be. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I've known a, a number of friends and actually contributing editors to Reason who were um, libertarian, you know, small L. Uh, and were members of the Democratic Party or the Republican yeah. Party or the Libertarian Party or, you know, um, Noam Chomsky called himself a libertarian socialist at various mm. points. Bill Buckley called himself a libertarian conservative, you know, so uh, depending on, you know, what what day of the week it is or what time of the year, um, you know, uh, sometimes people like using the adjective libertarian because I think it connotes in its in its best form a kind of interest in innovation and laissez faire in the best way possible, not, mm. you know, not do what uh, do unto others, then split, but rather a kind of relaxed, tolerant, open approach to thinking about things like um, philosophy, speech, lifestyle, as well as also economic uh, innovation and things like that. So um, it's not surprising that, um, you know, a lot of business leaders uh, at various points have called themselves libertarian or have been plausibly accused of that. Somebody like Jeff Bezos of Amazon uh, is an example of that. But um, yeah, the Daily Beast put me on the right, um, which, you know, I kind of chafe at because I'm not socially conservative and I'm not, I, I guess I'm fiscally conservative in the idea that I think government should, you know, we should pay for the government that we want. 
Um, but um, I also was a columnist at the Daily Beast for a few years after that. So, um, you know, I like to think of libertarian as, um, you know, it's obviously on the political spectrum somewhere, but it's a little bit different. And at its best, you know, it, it takes what's best about being a liberal uh, and the best about what's being conservative and kind of, uh, you know, mixes it into a, a nice, yeah. uh, you know, blended ice cream cone or something. I always viewed it as analogous to the Baha'i religious faith. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the only people I know who were Baha'i were Seals and Croft, the uh, singers of Summer Breeze. Mm. So can tell me what Baha'i faith is and I'll Well, they, they uh, I'll like to you. take the... They they kind of uh, talk about how they're every religion. They they mm -hmm. they're not into the divisiveness, but they're into you know they believe they're peaceful and they believe in picking the best of of everything and um, it's kind of a universal faith. They consider yeah. themselves a universal faith. So anyway, I, I it seems like a, a little. I bit like the nice. idea of it being attractive, and you know I think libertarians sometimes uh, harken back to uh, a, a kind of what's called classical liberalism or you know liberal. Liberal political ideology, which, uh, you know, which, which includes people on the right and the left in America, but it came out of, you know, uh, the end of the uh, age of monarchs and aristocracy. And it was the idea that individuals are capable of making decisions for themselves and we should create social and political, cultural, economic institutions that allow individuals more freedom to make choices about the things that matter most to them. And I think that includes, you know, things like, um, you know, who do, who do you get to marry or whether you want to marry at all? Um, you know, do you uh, do you have to ask permission, you know, from some kind of lord or some kind of, uh, you know, uh, um, authority before you get on with your life or not? Uh, those types of things and that government should be representative and it should be limited. You know, I, I do believe uh, and I guess this is, you know, part and parcel of the liberal project uh, properly understood that there are certain rights that the majority doesn't get uh, to uh, minimize simply because it's the majority. Um, you know, nobody should be forced to worship. Uh, you know, a God that they find false. Nobody should be forced to, uh, you know, be a slave. Nobody should be forced into the army, things like that, unless there are really, um, you know, particular um, and, and short-lived circumstances that require stepping on people's, uh, you know, freedom to, to, to basically live how they want. So there's probably not too many libertarians in Afghanistan right now. Yeah, it's a real, um, you know, this is a, uh, a real problem. The libertarian uh, movement, and I would say it has been, you know, one of the most vocal and consistent critics of American foreign policy in terms of interventionism into places like, like Afghanistan and Iraq. And I think, you know, we can point to the 21st century, you know, as 21 uninterrupted years of terrible foreign policy that has failed to deliver on the objectives that it laid out. Um, you know, we did not nation build in Afghanistan and we did not nation build in Iraq. Yet there's no question there's, you know, a real taste of ashes when you look, uh, you know, at the idea that, uh, you know, the, the U.S. deposed the Taliban, which is, you know, a medieval, horrible, you know, uh, you know, uh, terrible authoritarian regime. We put our own people in, uh, you know, and uh, we forestall an inevitable, you know, uh, return of the Taliban and actually helped abet it where we spent trillions of dollars. We lost thousands of American lives, plus, you know, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of Afghan lives without really accomplishing anything. Um, so it's, you know, it's. As a sign, I think, that the government, uh, you know, a, a government in America which struggles to vaccinate people that are, you know, directly here and under, you know, within our culture, uh, it's not that good at that. And that it would, you know, it was ruinous when it goes into places like Afghanistan and Iraq and other parts of the world and says, OK, we're going to we're going to fix everything and we're going to make everything, uh, you know, people, you know, into a better world. Um, yet, you know, that being faced with. The evidence of that failure is still really stunning. And I think uh, not to spend too much time on a psychology uh, podcast about foreign policy, but one of the things that's truly disturbing um, is that 
the United States um, is really being cheap and miserly with the amount of refugees from Afghanistan that we are willing to kind of process and bring to the country. The very least we could do is to really make sure that we get all of the people who are on our side, who cooperated with us, who are trying to build a better and more modern and more pluralistic Afghanistan, you know, get out if they want to. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a horrible debacle. Oh yeah, it's so horrible. And uh, what you're saying sounds just like a human humanitarian approach. It doesn't need to be labeled as a particular political approach. You know, it's a yeah hum- humanitarian idea. Um, no, absolutely, I'm with you on that. Very much with you on that. Uh, you're uh, an interesting guy. Uh, I don't know how to segue into this, but you're mm-hmm. you're just like a fun guy to like party with. Um, Robert Draker of the New York Times Magazine writes that you are, quote, to libertarianism what Lou Reed is to rock and roll, the quintessence, the quintessence of its outlaw spirit. Um, now, is this like, you know, and I do this with all my guests. I did this with Noam Chomsky. Mm-hmm. I did this with I'm, it, w- your childhood. Let's talk about your childhood for a second. Okay. Were you like, did you have a leather jacket when you were 10 years old? Were you um, like, what is, tell me about the precursor of modern day Nick Gillespie. Um, well, okay, and let me just start with the uh, reference to Lou Reed. Is uh, you know one thing in my childhood, unlike Lou Reed, I did not receive electroshock treatment. Uh, thankfully, Fair. I grew up. Uh, yeah, he grew up in in Long Island. I grew up in New Jersey, and New Jersey, I guess, was a little bit more tolerant. But um, my, I grew up lower middle class. My parents were um, uh, uneducated people. They were the children of immigrants, and um, they participated both in you know what that meant to uh, grow up poor. Uh, my father was uh, of Irish extraction. My, all of my grandparents were from Europe. Um, he was Irish. My mother was Italian. Grew up speaking uh, Italian until she went to grammar school. And, um, you know, they worked hard and they participated in that incredible, um, you know, kind of journey of the greatest generation of going from, you know, poverty um, and World War II, real privation to, you know, doing well after the war. And, um, you know, one of the things that they passed on to me was a, um, uh, you know, a sense that, um, you can always be doing better, um, or that the world should always be getting better. And it was odd because in many ways they were depressive, um, and they had a lot of issues that I think were linked to how they were raised, but also, or the circumstances under which they were raised, but they also believed, you know, and I think they got this from their, uh, their parents, my grandparents, that, um, you know, the world should keep getting better and that you can work and, and get, have a better life and that your kids will have a better life. I have two kids. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, divorced, but I have two sons who are, uh, one's 27 and one's 20. And I certainly hold forward for that. As a kid, I would say in terms of personality and temperament, I'm the youngest of three. Um, I really appreciate being the youngest child, um, because my parents who were old when they had kids to begin with, uh, but they were kind of tired and I had an older brother and an older sister who kind of, you know, they were the heat shields. They took up, they soaked up all of the expectations that the first son and the only daughter had. Um, and so I was given more free reign and I was, um, I'd say I was a contrarian. I was a, um, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of anti-authority from the get-go, but it was, mm. I'd say I was actually less anti-authority and more questioning of authority. And so, you know, on the one hand, I was kind of a cut up in school and kind of annoying to my teachers because I asked why a lot, but I also was, uh, you know, I was an Eagle Scout. I joined the Boy Scouts and became an Eagle Scout. I was the captain of my high school soccer team. So, um, you know, I, I like to do a lot of different things and I'd like to try and master whatever I'm doing or I did. Um, I gave up Catholicism. I was raised Catholic because I realized that if I really wanted to legitimately critique Catholicism, I'd have to become Pope because I felt like you needed to know something and master something before you could critique it. So I was like, okay, done with that. I'd like to take a moment to talk about our sponsor, BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? For quite a lot of us right now during this coronavirus pandemic, we are struggling with our most fundamental basic needs, such as our needs for security, connection, and opportunities to master our work. I think all of us could use some therapy right now. I know I sure could. 
which is why I've really been enjoying working with a professional therapist at BetterHelp so I can realize the best version of myself even under the current circumstances. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating with your therapist in just under 48 hours. Note that it's not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There is a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. In fact, the service is available for clients worldwide. What I really like about BetterHelp is that you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as you often have to do with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is really committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. Here's a recent one. Camilla helped me turn my life around. Everything has been so positive for me since our first session. Deep gratitude. I'm pleased to announce a special offer for listeners of the Psychology Podcast. You can get 10% off your first month of professional counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash psychpodcast. That's better H-E-L-P slash psych podcast. Join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Okay, now back to the show. Yeah, I mean, everything you just described sounds like uh, it, it's almost inevitable that you would uh, resonate with the Libertarian Party. You know, there's this interesting uh, combination I see in a lot of people who identify as Libertarians, and that's just kind of what you described, it, it, the, the combination of this individualistic spirit with with a drive for doing good or morality mm. in some sense or wanting to, uh, you know, like you said, you're an Eagle Scout, you know. Um, I think some people might have this misconception of libertarianism that like individualism, you know, Ayn Ar- Rand, you know, sort of right. like everyone for themselves who cares about others. But just, I mean, my own personal experience with a lot of people who identify the libertarian, uh, libertarianism is that they, um, you know, a lot of them are in like the, um, the, uh, the rational altruism movement, for instance, you know, they, they, yeah. uh, they want to do in a maybe in a very utilitarian sort of way, but the greatest good. Yeah, I, I you know, I think uh, there's the whole Ayn Rand kind of tradition and kind of dogma and canard, uh, you know, and, and Ayn Rand, I guess, was, you know, extremely influential in post-war America and in general culture. And it's always interesting when you read that people like Angelina, Angelina Jolie and Oliver Stone and Brad Pitt are all like big Ayn Rand fans and they're all dying to bring Atlas Shrugged or uh, the Fountainhead to the to the big screen or something, uh, it kind of makes sense because she was, you know, big on like great individuals and all of that kind of stuff. But that um, had nothing to do with me uh, growing up or, um, you know, or how I got into into kind of libertarianism. Um, and it was really, uh, for me, I always, um, and I, I always like to say, by the way, that Ayn Rand uh, pronouns, you know, because people uh, announce their pronouns now, her pronouns would be I, me, and mine. Um, but I'm, uh, I am, um, you know, like for me, it was more, always more about empathy and autonomy. It's, uh, you know, I, I know, um, I, I also consider myself a postmodernist, uh, in a, a very, you know, literal sense or, or, you know, definitional sense of, um, what, um, uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard called, uh, yeah, he said that postmodernism is, uh, characterized by incredulity toward meta narrative. It's not a, it's not saying that truth and authority cannot be legitimate or exist, but rather that we should always be skeptical towards it because truth is partial, it's provisional, and it's always changing. And for me, that resonates very strongly with my own limits of knowledge. Um, and a political philosophy, one of the reasons why government, I think, or authority should not be able to just do whatever they want is because we need to have, you know, some uh, epistemological humility uh, in the world. And I know I don't know very much. Um, but for me, it's always, you know, empathy and autonomy are, are kind of the guiding lights of, of a contemporary libertarian uh, sensibility for me, as well as curiosity and uh, comfort with pluralism and um, and being tolerant um, and also just being curious and interested in, in the world around you. 
We had talked about this actually when you were gracious enough to have me on your podcast. We're talking yep. about that sounds a lot like Abraham Maslow's philosophy, you know, yep. the, the humanistic yep. psychologist. Um, I'm you know, very interested. You know, yeah. yeah, I read your book about Maslow, you know, with great mm. interest because I think this is, uh, you know, and I think about this a lot where I'm, I'm, you know, basically two generations removed from peasant stock in Europe. Um, and where my ancestors, both on my father's side and my mother's side, have been raised to be, you know, serfs and peasants for, you know, millennia. Um, and, you know, God, like, I, you know, the, I mean, the most amazing thing is to be born in the 20th or the 21st century. And for all of the horrible things that are going on in the world, there are fewer of them. And there is more hope and more, you know, kind of, um, you know, possibility of movement towards self-actualization, you know, than ever before, I think. And, um, you know, we would be fools to blow that opportunity. Uh, but I find Maslow, um, you know, interesting because it is about, um, you know, it's about the individual realizing his or her potential, um, but always in a social context, always in a historical context. But it really is that mix of, individuals and groups and kind of movement towards some sense, you know, kind of creating a horizon and then moving towards it is, is extremely interesting. And I think that the institutions that kind of flow in and out of libertarian ideas, and that includes limited government, uh, but it also includes freedom of speech and free thinking um, and about fluidity, you know, whether it's gender fluidity or ideas, mixing of different types of people and ideas, all of this stuff, um, you know, kind of wraps together in a way that is, um, you know, I, I think it's both attractive, but also actually has really good effects in the world. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I have a lot more to say to that, but I we, we discussed that on your podcast. Mm -hmm. I actually would direct listeners to go to Nick's podcast and uh, check out that conversation. That was a really interesting conversation. I enjoyed it. Um, what is your relationship to Mr. MXYZPTLK. Oh, Mr. Mitzel Pitalik. Uh, that was yeah, my Yeah, I wasn't sure how to plume. pronounce his name. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Mitzel Pitalik is a, uh, Superman, uh, supervillain. He's a imp from, I think, the fifth dimension, and he was one of the few people because he traded in magic. He could kind of run circles around Superman. And, um, uh, in the 90s, I wrote uh, on a regular basis for an early website called Suck.com, which was not pornographic, despite its name. It was, you know, Suck.com in the sense of, like, everything sucks. And it was an early website um, that started out making fun mostly of, of the tech world and of Silicon Valley and the uh, kind of emerging digital culture of the 1990s and then broadened out into... Um, you know, a, a general critique of kind of, uh, internet culture and consumer culture and, and all sorts of things that were going on in the 1990s. And I wrote a, uh, particularly kind of, um, uh, mean but funny, I hope, uh, piece, uh, that, uh, was about Christopher Reeve, the Superman actor who had, uh, become crippled after having a horse riding. Um, accident and a uh, horse jumping accident. And I had uh, written a piece with the basic idea of which was that um, getting crippled was the best uh, career move Christopher Reeve have, had ever made. And then I kind of worked through that. Um, and Mr. Mitzel Pitalik was a good name for that. And uh, that's kind of indicative of the sorts of things that people wrote at Suck. And it has a... Um, an interesting history of uh, alumni uh, among the better known uh, alums of um, of suck.com are Jake Tapper of CNN oh, and wow. James uh, James Poniewozik who is now the New York Times uh, television critic. So it's a it's an interesting group and a, a throwback to a, a simpler America. Well, I didn't know Jake Tapper was funny. Yeah. He was, wow. uh, his, uh, nom de plume, if I'm remembering correctly, was James Bong. <laughs> Are you serious? Is this something yes. he wants to be, uh, to resurrected? <laughs> this knowledge? He does, he does not run from it. He, he doesn't offer it up, but he, he doesn't shirk from it when it comes up in, uh, in conversations or interviews. Now, Nick, were you under any substances when you came up with the name, uh, Mr. Mrs. Goldberg book? No, I don't think so. I, uh, okay. as you know, I am a, um, I'm a fan of, um, psychedelic drugs for a variety of reasons, both because I think, 
uh, they're enjoyable, but they also are, um, you know, increasingly being used for, um, you know, medical uses for treatment of PTSD and things like that. Uh, thing, uh, substances ranging from MDMA to psilocybin to LSD, which mm. itself has a long history of being used to treat alcoholism and other kinds of, uh, Issues, um, but uh, no, I was uh, I was stone cold sober uh, when I mm. wrote as Mister Mitzel Pitalik. And you did seem the name just came to you. Yeah, well, it's a you know if you're making fun of Superman or an actor who played Superman, it's kind of obvious. And it's uh, he's uh, you know uh, it's a it's a good character because he's kind of an imp and uh, a troll and Superman. I love it. Uh, he had to, the way that you defeated him was by tricking him into saying his name backwards somehow, and then he would kind of disappear and go back to his own dimension. But I love it. I love it. Thank you for talking with me about that. These are burning sure. questions I had. Um, <laughs> now you look in 1997, you wrote a cover story for a reason called child proofing the world, mm -hmm. which is really, um, really anticipated a lot of stuff, um, that's, yeah. that's going on now in the world, such as free range parenting and, um, Jonathan Haidt and, uh, Greg Lukianos, book coddling of the American mind. Now, where do you think we are now compared to then 97? Do you think things are even worse? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. And uh, the, the story Child Proof in the World, which was, you know, grew out of my experience raising my older son, who was in uh, who was born in 1993. Um, but um, it, it was basically looking at at the time in the 90s. And it's kind of hard to remember this, um, but especially in the late 90s. There, the rhetoric and discourse about children in America, especially coming from people like Hillary Clinton and Marion Wright Edelman of the Children's Defense Fund, was that um, uh, uh, kind of against all, you know, observed trends, they uh, they insisted that children were at higher risk for all sorts of problems, that they were having more kind of breakdowns that they were having more medical problems that they you know they they weren't going to school etc it was it was very odd and very much at odds with everything that was going on in fact children in the 90s were doing drugs less they were having less sex with fewer people at older ages you know which was perceived as being a good thing um, you know younger children went to, you know had more enrichment programs both before and after school I mean every uh, kids volunteered in, in numbers and, and in, in a way that was just unimaginable. I'm, I, I was born in 1963. I'm at the very end of the, the, the tail of the baby boom. And, um, you know, like nobody in my generation, like compared to just, you know, 15 years earlier, and now we were raising these angels in, in a much safer world where things like child abuse, um, crimes against children, children dying young, all of that had declined almost to the point of being, you know, uh, uh, you know, totally rare when it happened. But we were talking about kids as being threatened by all sorts of things. And I chalked it up in that story to a wide variety of things, including the fact that we were much wealthier as a society in general and having fewer kids. So each kid kind of counted for more that parents had higher and higher expectations for their children. They were treating their children as kind of markers for their own success. Uh, and this is something that I think often happens, you know, where uh, parents kind of project all of their desires onto their kids. Um, but there was also a recurring kind of um, psychology that I think came out of the uh, uh, Dr. Spock's uh, infant oh, yeah. and baby or baby and child care which was this kind of weird v perversion. I, I, I'm not actually not sure if it was a perversion or, or an accurate read of, of a kind of uh, watered down Freudianism of the idea that like, you know, be careful with your kids, like have authority, you, you know more than you're doing, the book says famously at the beginning, but it's like, you know, relax and do a good job raising your kids because you can really screw them up. So there was this sense of children as kind of like China dolls who could be cracked and shattered by you know, the wrong look or, or a single incident early in their lives or whatever. Um, and so, you know, that was the starting point. And I ended that story, which is online at uh, Reason's website, you know, saying, like, given all of this, like, our, you know, kids, and I was talking about millennials and, you know, kind of looking towards Gen Z, um, are kids going to become, you know, risk-taking daredevils or are they going to become 
kind of withdrawn and scared of their own shadows and incapable of really kind of transitioning into an adult world where they might get knocked around a little bit because we had been spending so much time child proofing the world to make sure that they never had a bad experience, that they never suffered any kind of anxiety, et cetera. And I think, you know, we, we kind of have an answer to that, which is that we have, we now live in a world where children and uh, people like John Haidt and Jean Twang, uh, or Twangy, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce her name, have just published a piece, uh, a study about how, um, you know, the level of anxiety and loneliness in children is at, you know, record high levels and things like that. And books like The Coddling of the American Mind flesh this out in Lenore Skenazy's Free Range uh, uh, Parenting and Free Range Childhood point to this. Um, and, um, you know, so in a way, I think we are reaping you know, the, we're reaping the whirlwind of, of how we parented in the nineties. Um, and it's, you know, it's understandable. It's totally human. I know I went out of my way to protect my kids from what I imagined would be negative situations in a way that my parents either didn't want to or didn't, you know, couldn't. Um, and I think socially, um, you know, there's a lot of negative, negative issues that come out of that because I think children are less resilient or young adults are less resilient than they might have been otherwise. And that that's a real problem for society. People, people, um, rep, you know, they feel, um, like even mild, um, incursions on their personal space or their sense of self. Are, you know become traumatic um, and that's just that's not a good way to, to get through uh, get through life no or even childhood I'd like to take a moment to talk about one of our sponsors Skillshare as I talk about in my book wired to create each of us has the capacity to explore our creativity and be inspired to put something new into existence whether you're a dabbler or a pro a hobbyist or a master the fact is, you can be creative. Skillshare is an online learning community that can enable your intrinsic motivation to explore and create new projects, with the added bonus of having the support of fellow creatives. In essence, Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real creative growth. Discover what you can make with classes for every skill level. Experience real improvement with hands-on projects and classes designed for real life. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable especially when compared to pricey in-person classes and workshops. An online subscription is less than $10 a month. Personally, I've been enjoying the course Finding Fulfillment, Using Pivots to Power Your Creative Career, taught by Emma Gannon. As Emma points out, it may seem scary making a big change in life and going in a different direction, but it's often so essential to creative growth to do so. Creative Pivots is all about making space to make change. I've done a lot of pivots in my life, and she taught me some tools that I can use to plan a big future pivot I've been contemplating recently. I also really liked hearing the stories from her guests. The stories were really inspiring, and I found her whole course just incredibly practical. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash psych and get a one month free trial of premium membership. That's one month of a premium membership at Skillshare.com slash psych. I'd like to take a moment to talk about one of our sponsors, Honey. Whether I want a shipment of groceries delivered right to my door or I'm shopping online for new podcasting equipment, I'm always searching for the best deals. That's the problem. I'm searching and searching and watching my free time slip away. Sometimes I'll find a coupon, but most of the time I give up. Luckily, I found out about Honey. Thanks to Honey, I don't have to manually search for coupon codes anymore. Honey is the free shopping tool that supports over 300,000 online stores and scours the internet for promo codes so you don't have to. When you check out, the Honey button drops down for you to click, and if it finds a working coupon, it is applied automatically. Just the other day, I saved $13.50 on a new cool pair of pajamas. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on free savings. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com psychology. That's joinhoney.com psychology. Um, what is what is is this what is this described as soft parenting is that what soft parenting is yeah well you know i think when people talk about hard versus soft parenting you know that's kind of like uh you know benjamin spock versus uh bruno bettelheim you know are kind of the classic sides and bettelheim 
uh, you know, who, whose life ended under, you know, a cloud of uh, plagiarism and, and a variety of other kind of bad behavior. Um, but, you know, he was like, kind of, you know, like, you, you know, treat your kid as a, as a little adult and really kind of be tough on them. Spock seemed to be much more kind of loosey goosey and loving. And, uh, you know, obviously the answer is something in between. Um, it is amazing to me as much as I might say, you know, my generation's parenting, and I think this is true of Gen X as well as many of the baby boom parents, um, you know, that we might have tended to go a little bit too far in being friends with our kids or, or refusing to be authority figures um, in a way that helps structure early childhood and that gives, peop- uh, gives kids a, uh, a kind of framework to push back against and test limits and understand where they are as they're figuring out who they are psychologically and, you know, as a person. Um, we might have been a little too mushy on that part. But then when I think back to my parents' generation or, or older generations where parents are just almost completely emotionally unavailable for their children, um, you know, that's bad, too. Um, so I think what we're seeing is a weird form of soft parenting um, in that we are trying to make the world, you know, a kind of feather bed so that if our kid falls, they don't break their teeth or anything like that. By the same token, though, you know, one of the things, and this is especially true of upper middle class people, and, you know, more and more people are educated, more and more people are upper middle class, and these are the people who are driving discussions about parenting, and these are the kids that we listen to, you know, kids who are in college complaining about this or that, um, you know, there's a real passive aggression in all of that parenting where it's like, you know, I'm doing all of this for you and you better produce results as a kid, you know, like, uh, you know, the tiger mom uh, type mentality is, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, overt in what it demands from its children. But there's something like that even in the, you know, even in the parent who is your best friend you know, and is sending you to 30 different camps, you know, in a year and giving you enrichment programs all the time, you know, they, they're expecting something, you know, in return for that kind of uh, parental and emotional and financial investment. Uh, And that's, that's tough on kids. Um, I've written a lot uh, in the uh, period since um, the uh, Child Proofing the World story came out about millennials Um, Because, you know, I I also think um, generationally, you know, millennials are the single largest cohort now. Gen Z will, uh, in in a short period of time, become bigger than the baby boom itself as baby boomers start to die off. Um, And they're, you know, in many ways, the millennial uh, generation and Gen Z are really great. They're, you know, they're much smarter. uh, You know, they're they're healthier. They have a better future in front of them. I mean, I I don't I I dislike it when uh, older people just kind of hate young people because they're, you know, because they're young or anything like that. Um, But I did I wrote a piece for reason, um, co-authored a piece for reason in uh, I think like 2015 which was talking about how I I thought that the millennials were kind of the first generation in America. They were more ethnic, more multi-ethnic, more more multiracial. They had more opportunities. They were moving into positions of power. And they were kind of the, you know, one version of the American dream that I I think about a lot is the idea that, you you know, kind of America is kind of a Maslowian country where everybody can self-actualize. Everybody can become the individual that they want to be. This is the promise of America. And I thought that millennials were inheriting that. They were the first generation to really feel that. And then I realized a couple years later, and I talked with a lot of millennials, um, you know, a lot of them are very sour. And in the wake of, um, you know, the financial crisis, in the wake of COVID, they're kind of bitter. And I think part of the problem is, is that we expected them to, you know, um, have jobs that they loved and that express something meaningful and deep to them. Um, And like, you know, if you're 21 years old and you've just graduated college or you're coming out of high school and things like that, you know, that's a hell of a, you know, a hell of a requirement to put on people, not only to find a job in an economy that is rapidly transforming, but to find a job that is meaningful, pays the bills and expresses your deep commitments as a human being. Um, You know, that was... You know, that that's a bad expectation. It's, it's too much. And I think a lot of millennials have 
you know, have not been able to deal with that for understandable reasons. Yeah, I, I agree. And as someone who t- teaches millennials yeah. uh, about well-being and purpose and, and hearing their, their concerns and fears, and yeah, I think that that's really quite spot on. But there's also, um, and this, I guess, is my way of transitioning into a, a different topic. Um, yeah, but there, a lot of millennials, I mean, they feel like they're, especially, you know, people with, that have, uh, alternative genders, so to speak, mm-hmm. um, feel very marginalized, even though at the same time, it seems like ac- acceptance for it is everywhere. It, it to me, yeah. it seems paradoxical. That's my, per- in my perception. That's my perception. Um, what, what do you think about that? I, you know, I think it's, um, I think you're onto something where, you know, and this is something if, if you're over 40, um, you know what, what it was like to be gay or lesbian or bi, excuse me, or trans, queer, or, you know, just a non-conforming heterosexual. Um, you know, 20 years ago, um, it was, it was better than 40 years ago, but it's nothing compared to now where, um, you know, gender and sexuality have been, um, you know, the using those as barriers to acceptance or barriers to living, to getting married or to holding jobs and things like that. You know, that has effectively been eradicated, uh, which is a major triumph, I think. Of, Huge. I, I would say it's a libertarian victory. You know, this is one of the <laughs> great libertarian victories among various other things, which many of which uh, kind of cohere around lifestyle choices where it's like you can you can live and dress and eat and marry and, you know, whatever the way you want as, a, you know, and it's pretty much accepted. It's oftentimes it's, you know, it's legally, you know, that equality is legally mandated. It's like a great time. And, um, yeah, and at the same time, I think a lot of younger people, um, I think part of it is because they're experiencing it for the first time. You know, every, everybody's adolescence is uh, discombobulating and everybody only experiences their adolescence. Um, and um, I think, uh, you know, there's a lack of history that is endemic to youth, but is probably getting worse. Um, it's a real, you talk about paradoxes. Um, uh, you know, mm. the, the modern world, the contemporary world is rife with paradoxes. And one of them for me is that we now live in a world where virtually every book, every piece of music, every TV show, every movie is available, you know, at, you know, uh, with a mild Google search. And yet people seem less interested in the past than ever and kind of creating genealogies of meaning and tradition. Uh, that are hyper individualized to explain, you know, I do this all the time. I look back at, you know, what made me the thing, you know, what are the influences on me? And I can fill in all the gaps in a way that I couldn't 30 years ago because it was, you know, the information just wasn't there, but, but we're less interested in that. And I think that feeds into some of what you're talking about where people, weirdly, we live in a world where race, class, and gender are less of barriers in sexual orientation than they ever have been, and yet that becomes the focal point of feeling ostracized. Um, I think we need to pay attention to that. I think we need to also address it with more and better history. Um, and I also think that, you know, we need to recognize that we live in a society where there's kind of psychological economy where being um, uh, saying that you are an outsider, saying that you are being discriminated against, saying that you are not allowed to fully participate in the established, you know, f- fruits of society, you know, demanding and saying you are being ostracized is a very um, it's a move that gets rewarded very quickly in contemporary um, society at the university level, also in the corporate level and things like that. And so, you know, if you incentivize people to, you know, say they are out, you know, they're being um, demonized, they're being discriminated against, I think you're going to get more more of that kind of behavior and that thought. Yeah, the, uh, but, uh, you know, there has been an enormous progress. Um, it, it just it perplexes me, I suppose, when people like Steven Pinker points to progress and then people are like, oh, he's on the far right. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, progress is a thing of, wasn't that a liberal uh, thing at one point? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, and of course, the, I, I guess part of the fear is, um, 
you know, that if you say, look, things are better than they were 10 years ago. So, you know, then the next line is shut up and just, you know, eat oh, your I porridge see. or something. Yeah, that, I don't know. But it it's, you know, well. yeah, by the yeah. same token, there's a weird kind of, I think, uh, kind of psychological or psychic emotional arbitrage that's going on. And you see this in many discussions about uh, race relations or race positions, as well as things, you know, like trans rights and whatnot, where people will you know, um, call, um, they'll, they'll use writings or observations by somebody like James Baldwin writing, say, in 1955 about a country that was still, you know, rife with de jure segregation. Um, and they'll kind of conjure him up to talk about what's going on now as if there hasn't been, uh, you know, 60 years or more, 70 years of change and progress. And so, um, you know, I think we need to, we, you know, you always need to listen to what people are saying, especially people who are saying, I am not participating fully. I am being uh, discriminated against. I don't feel part of the group. Those are real, um, you know, meaningful, um, you know, uh, kind of words and emanations and feelings that we need to take seriously. But we also need to um, not constantly be, um, you know, saying that, uh, you know, is, is America more racist now than it was 60 years ago or, or 100 years ago? No, it isn't. And we've had progress along these lines. How do we identify that? How do we recognize that? And then how do we kind of keep that moving forward? Um, and I feel like we're in now in a world where people are not interested in moving forward. Uh, people are interested in kind of settling scores or, assuming that all of the resources that are ever going to be available are on the table right now and it's kind of a land grab to see who gets the most of what's on the table and that's not really the way that societies can and should work we need to be thinking about how do we expand opportunities how do we how do we create a world that we can barely envision now in which individuals and groups uh, that they voluntarily form can do whatever they want i think it's a really um, odd moment for, um, in many ways, over the past 25 years, you know, and I, I've been a reason for I, coming up on like 27 years. My professional career has mostly been a reason. And, um, you know, one of the things that has happened in many parts of our lives, we've been getting more and more individualized. When you think about the types of food you buy or when you go to a restaurant, the clothing you buy, everywhere you go, Everything is more individualized, um, and yet we are. When we talk, we, when we talk about social and cultural identities, we've gone through this phase now where we are re we are returning to the crudest abstractions to talk about who we are as individuals. We're either black or we're white or we're Asian. I mean, people aren't even talking about you know the subgroups that make up Asian Americans. Um, and this is, strikes me as profoundly wrong because people are more mixed than ever. And that is a good thing. And it's a positive thing. And I wish that we were willing to talk more about a kind of what I, I consider a glorious mongrelization of race, class, gender, sexual orientation. I mean, there are so many more possibilities now. Everything is like Baskin Robbins or, you know, a Starbucks where you can have an infinite number of combinations and as you become interested in something, you can recombine in all sorts of new ways where I, I uh, wrote uh, an essay years ago about how the X-Men were the model for what everybody wants to be. You want to be a mutant. You want to be recombined. You want to be a shapeshifter and changing all the time. And this is a really good thing. And yet in many ways, you know, over the past, you know, decade, maybe, um, we seem to be going back into cruder and cruder kind of tribal sensibilities. And, um, you know, that's very troubling. And I think it helps explain why we have, um, you know, a, it, it helps explain a lot of the negativity in public discourse. Oh, yeah, yeah for, for sure. Uh, and it relates to uh, to cancel culture and, and kind of that drive. You have a cover story coming out um, in uh, October uh, in the issue of Reason Magazine called Self-Cancellation, Deplatforming, and Censorship, a Taxonomy of Cancel Culture, which outlines libertarian concerns over suppressing speech at various levels. Mm -hmm. Now, you open up this article talking about how we're living in an age of cancel culture. Now, can you explain uh, a little bit how you define cancel culture? What, what are the parameters you put around the, a phenomenon that you would describe as cancel culture? 
Yeah, um, you know, and, and one of the things I, I uh, use a uh, definition that uh, Jonathan Rausch, who's a, um, a writer um, who years ago, um, um, he uh, wrote a book about um, uh, called Kindly Inquisitors, the new attacks on free thought or free thinking and free speech, which anticipated a lot of the world we're living in. And he, um, he has a new book out, um, called The Constitution of Knowledge, and he distinguishes canceling from mere criticism. And he says that, you know, canceling has to do with, there, there's a social media component to it, but a public, it, it isn't always, uh, you know, social media, but there's a public dimension to it and that it's, you know, people who are into canceling people, into cancel culture, are seeking to organize and manipulate social and media in a social or media environment in order to isolate, deplatform, or intimidate ideological opponents. And it's different than criticism. Criticism is about engaging somebody's arguments and rebutting it or reframing it and saying, you know what, this is a better way of thinking about things. Cancel culture, and you see this all the time, where people will say, I'm not even going to read the work or engage it. This person should lose their job. They should lose their standing. They should be deplatformed off of Twitter, off of YouTube, out of a university job, out of a, a corporate job. Um, you know, that's what cancel culture is really about. And it's a kind of sensorial mindset, which is saying, you know what, if I don't agree with something and I don't like something, I'm not just going to ignore it or, 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 you know, better yet, debate it. I'm going to try to strike it from the known universe of, of discourse and conversation. So I think, you know, that's one way of getting at cancel culture. Um, we can, you know, exactly how you measure, you know, what's, you know, the volume of cancellation, et cetera. But, um, you know, there is something I think most people would agree there is something going on which is new and different. Uh, it's not that it's completely unique to the current moment or something, but, you know, earlier in the year, one of the people I uh, talk about in the story is the uh, the banjoist from the, the band Mumford and Sons who self-canceled after he had um, he uh, tweeted out a um, you know to Andy No, a controversial journalist who's a kind of right wing you know people some people call him a troll other people say he's a good investigative journalist but he wrote a book about Antifa in Portland and this banjoist said you know that was a, a fascinating book an interesting book and then like you know a couple hours later after you know he got a lot of negative press and his bandmates got on his case, you know, he was like, I realize I've made, you know, a, I said horrible things and I'm taking a break from Twitter. I mean, it's very cultural revolution, uh, you know, from Mao's China of like where people are not only being punished, but they are being kind of forced or cajoled into admitting the errors of their ways and silencing themselves. That's something that I think anybody who believes in kind of liberal discourse free thought, you know, and free and free expression really should be uh, worried about this kind of thing. Yeah, I'm going to quote quote you. This is life today in the United States where a seemingly infinite supply of such incidents appears on a seemingly hourly basis like automated bursts of super concentrated air freshener in airport bathrooms. There is this idea of um uh it, it's very biblical owning your sins. Yeah. Now, there's this idea of owning your sins is very important, and only particular people, you know, in our society are, are, are on the hot seat right now, you know, to own right. those sins, and others aren't. To me, it, it kind of, it doesn't feel like it, it takes into account the full complexity of being human. To me, from a humanistic psychology perspective, it doesn't acknowledge that there's good and bad in all of us, no matter what side right. you're on, yeah. you know. Um, do you agree? I, I, yeah, you know, I think um, I, w I would put it a little bit differently. There's definitely a, you know, a racial dimension to this, where it's like if you are, you know, a cisgender white man, particularly, um, you know, but not always if, if you're over 50, you are much, you know, you are in, the, you know, the hot seat to be, you know, you have more things adding up to that. Uh, and I, but I don't think it's primarily racial because also, you know, mm -hmm. consider, you know, one of the leaders of Black Lives Matter after it came out that she had purchased a wide variety of homes, uh, of right. expensive homes in elite neighborhoods, stepped down. You know, she stepped away from the organization. So 
this type of stuff comes, you know, comes for everybody. And as I point out, it's a good point. Um, as I point, as I point out in the story, I mean, one of the kind of, you know, it's it's somewhat comical, but it also hopefully, you know, shows that this stuff has a, sh- a certain shelf life. But where, um, you know, a podcast at Gimlet Media, which was designed to kind of do a deep dive on how awful it was to work at Condé Nast Bon Appetit. Uh, two episodes into that podcast, the the people, the producers of the podcast canceled themselves because people who worked with them said, you're just as bad as the people at Condé Nast. So it's like, mm-hmm. you know, you get into this thing where the revolution eats its own and all of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. But I think what we're witnessing also is, you know, what feeds into cancel culture, apart from, the, you know, this uh, kind of free floating sense of, um, you know, of people feeling um, injured and um, aggressed by, you know, random and stray thoughts that, you know, in the past might not have risen to the level of, you know, of anger and public uh, public shouting. Um, there's also a generational dimension going on, you know, that this is a way of clearing out the top of the pyramid. Um, and, you know, and again, the millennials yeah. are coming, you know, the older older millennials are now in their early 40s. Them and Gen Z dwarf, you know, uh, baby boomers and Gen X. And, and, you know, they want to move up and out into the world. So that when you see people like, you know, Senator Al Franken is a good example. Yeah. The, you know, Senator, Democratic Senator, liberal, progressive. I mean, this is a guy who worked at Air America and made, you know, his biggest best selling books were attacking Rush Limbaugh for being a big fat idiot, you know, and a liar and things like that. Um, you know, he got canceled. Um, and I think, you know, it's, you know, it, it, looking back now, it's kind of hard to believe. It's not even clear what he exactly he was canceled for, but he got squeezed out. Um, and it's kind of generational, you know, and it's like you're looking at who are the people in power positions? How do you get rid of them? And that way, you know, it frees up some space to move up. Um, so I think that's a big part of this. And it, and it kind of weds with that sense of, um, you know, kind of, what uh, what we were talking about of people feeling very um, uncomfortable with conflict, uh, feeling very tender to the world. And, you know, if you grew up believing that, you know, the world was kind of uh, simultaneously the world was your oyster, because, you know, if you're a millennial um, or Gen Z, you're growing up in a world where you're constantly being told, here are all of the things that are in front of you. Here are all of the things that are available. But then you have parents or a society which is also trying to make sure that you never encounter, um, you know, some kind of reality that tells you you're not that special, et cetera. I think when you combine that, the sensibility that grows out of that kind of child proofing, um, you, you know, kind of generational child proofing plus a real desire in a sense that, you know what, like old people, you know, baby boomers aren't going anywhere. You know, uh, at least the greatest generation, you know, by the time they were 60, they were dying to retire. Um, you know, we have a president who's, you know, 100 years old and he beat a guy who was like 95 years old, who beat a woman who was 90 years old. You know, like it's, you know, there's a weird kind of gerontocracy at work culturally, economically, yeah. politically in America, which I think is also fueling cancel culture in a very real way. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, sort of end on a, another quote of yours that I like. I, I liked a lot of these, uh, things. I liked a lot of things you said in this article. You said contemporary cancel culture can take on left and right flavorings and it can be enforced by governments, corporations, or individuals, but it all works to reduce our ability not just to talk freely, but to live freely. And that is reason enough to contest it at every level. That's a very compelling argument. Um, if you believe in free speech, if you believe in, um, yep. in human, freedom of the spirit of autonomy self-actualization it seems like it's hard to argue with that um, regardless of where on the political lines it falls so um yeah. thanks for writing that article nick and 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 thank you for being on the podcast today and for uh, dare i say being my friend it's been great getting to know you personally as a human yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah same here i appreciate it and you know this is one of the things i i you know and i think that we definitely kind of overlap or intersect on in a meaningful way is thinking about the human potential movement and kind of positive yeah. psychology, I guess you would call it more. Um, and, you know, this is like an incredible moment um, 
it's, you know, there are so many possibilities and we can do so many things. And it's, you know, I worry that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like we've, you know, we've, we've reached escape velocity from so much of the crap of the past that is, you know, about racial, gender, sexual discrimination and things like that. And, you know, where we can do whatever we want. And, you know, a lot of us, I think, are shrinking from that freedom and kind of going back to older forms of uh, identity and regulating other people's lives. That is, uh, it, it, it would just be horrible to miss this opportunity to kind of actually create a 21st century, which is just fantastically better than anything that we, you know, that our parents or grandparents might have imagined. That's the exciting thing is the potential is there if we want it, you know, the, mm -hmm. um, the post-traumatic growth that I think is going to come about from this, uh, pandemic, I think is, it, it, we, at least I, I could say the potential there is huge, you know, whether yeah. or not we seize it or seize it or, so. seize it or not, or get, get drawn into the muck of, uh, arguments over who should wear masks or not is up to us. Mm -hmm. But yeah, thank you, Nick. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Scott. Thanks for listening to this episode of the psychology podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.